Happy Groundhog Day. I'm Charlie Sykes. Sunday Insight starts right now. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, the State of the Union was cold. It was sub-zero around here. At least you didn't have to live in Atlanta, which was absolutely shut down by two inches of snow. But spring can't be that far behind, right? The Brewers signed pitcher Matt Garza. A new Marquette University law poll shows Governor Scott Walker leading Democrat challenger Mary Burke by six points, 47 to 41. And even though Mary Burke's been running for four months, 70% of voters don't know her well enough to even have an opinion. 54% of Wisconsinites think the state is headed in the right direction. A judge rules against the city's residency law. A propane shortage leads to a state of emergency. The president of the United States pledges to ignore Congress and rule by executive order. In Middleton, the teacher returns to his job, even though he was fired back in 2010 for watching porn on his classroom computer. Now, how's this for grand larceny? A 300-year-old Stradivarius violin worth millions of dollars is stolen in an armed robbery in which a symphony musician is tased. The Milwaukee County Board Committee approves a so-called living wage of $11.33 an hour. And a national poll finds Congressman Paul Ryan at the top of a wide open field of Republican presidential contenders. But we start with a presidential visit and a few no-shows. And we have Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abila. Okay, so uh, maybe that didn't go so well for the record, Mr. President. It's ably, but fresh off his State of the Union address, the president came to Waukesha to tout his agenda for jobs and job skill training, but there were some notable no-shows. Waukesha Mayor Jeff Screma said he refused to attend any events with either Obama or Scott Walker because he thought they were extremists. And the anointed Democratic candidate for governor, Mary Burke, said, yeah, she was too busy campaigning on the other side of the state to make it. That decision made national news since vulnerable Democrats across the country seem to be distancing themselves from the president. Last week's Marquette poll found that President Obama's disapproval rating is up to 50 percent here in Wisconsin. Well, support for his health plan has dropped to 35 percent. Now, joining me on our panel this morning, the Milwaukee Community Journal's Michael Holt, Milwaukee County Supervisor Deanna Alexander, political strategist Linda Bruin, and political consultant Mary Jo Boss. We'll start with you, Mary Jo. So why did Mary, uh, Mary Burke decide to be a no-show? Well, she's such a poll-driven, fabricated candidate that she's going to do whatever people tell her without even thinking about how it looks. This man is president of the United yeah. States. You have Walker out there doing business, talking about getting propane. Then you have Screma, who has water diversion issues and yeah. things he needs to talk to the feds about, and he doesn't even act like a grown-up and attend the event. Okay, well, let's talk about this. I mean, Mary, Mary, Mary Burke has you know, got a name recognition problem. She had a chance to have her picture on in every newspaper and every newscast in the entire state of Wisconsin with the President of the United States, and she decides that she wants, doesn't want to be in his same zip code. Your take on that. Yeah. I'm disappointed with both of them. Yeah. It's, it, it, what it shows is political immaturity, and frankly, it's not very classy. You know, when you ref to respect the office of the president of the United yeah. States means that sometimes you have to share the podium or the platform with an office holder that you don't particularly like. That's okay, what you're talking about. You're talking do. about screaming first, of all. yeah. Screaming yeah. and well, well, yeah. and or don't like or yeah. am worried you might have some negative campaign consequences. That's what political grown-ups do, and I think in the end they did a disservice to both of their. Constituencies yeah, but why campaigns. did Mary Burke? Mary Burke's campaign is run by Obama staffers. You have a chance to be on the platform with the most popular Democrat in the state of Wisconsin, and you decide to be in the western part of the state. Well, you know who she's upsetting? Yeah. yeah. Democrats. Yeah. I'm not happy about what she did okay, at all. Okay, why was, did she decide to be a no-show? Because she's not proud to stand with our no. president. Well, that's not what she's saying. Well, either she made this decision yeah. or her campaign staffers made this yeah. decision. And either way, I think that was the wrong decision if she's saying she's the dumb candidate that wants to carry the state. Uh, you would think so. Your, your reaction? Yeah, I took it as, at first I took it as an insult to the president. Uh, as, as you stated, you know, she had this unique opportunity to be in worldwide press. That was like $10 million of free advertising. So either it was insulting or she's just stupid. But this will come back. This will come back because there's a whole bunch of black Democrats who are saying, oh, you don't want to be with the man? It, Beside the fact that his people are running your it, campaign? It, you know, the, the explanation was, well, okay, you know, we had these other events, and this was an official event and whatnot, uh -huh. which is pretty much eyewash because these things are planned well in advance. 
I wondered whether or not there was a decision that, that an appearance at this event might be off message, because, and bear with me here, the president you know, chose four places to come after the State of the Union speech to talk about jobs and job creation, and he comes to Wisconsin where he is you know, clearly showcasing a successful job creating story at the GE plant in Waukesha. Well, isn't the whole democratic mantra about how terrible jobs are in Wisconsin, how we have to throw Scott Walker out of, uh, out of office because of the jobs? So, and that's what so she should have seen. So, so part of the seen. problem is, is that she shows up here and President Obama says, we're headed in the right direction, and she's saying we're not headed in the right direction. No, I think that that's too sophisticated yeah. of an analysis. That, uh, frankly, okay. I, <laughs> <all right. laughs> I, I think based Basically, someone in her campaign or she herself, and frankly, the buck stops with her, even if it was a lower level decision, decided that somehow showing up on the yeah. same platform with the President of the United States might somehow not woo independents there, or, or yeah. folks like that. And that's the wrong way to make send yeah. that kind okay, of message. Let's, let's, let's go back to Waukesha Mayor Screamer, who I think managed to do something very unusual, that, that he alienated both conservatives and liberals, <laughs> Democrats and Republicans, by saying, I won't show up anywhere where the President or where the Governor will show up because they're extremists and I'm, I'm what? In the middle. That, yes. What? Tell me again how he expects to work with both sides. Yeah. It, he's just alienated, alienated both of them. Um, the, what I found was interesting was he, the, he said they're extremists because they won't compromise, and then he's explaining why he won't even be in the same room right. with them. Right. Um, how is that going to work for him? Okay, what is your glass <laughs> half full, and what is your glass half empty this week? Let's go around the table, Michael Holt. Well, it's half full because the president intends to require all federal contractors to pay their employees at least $10 an hour. Okay. It's half empty because his executive order does not extend to the states or private sector. Yes, yeah, because of the Constitution. Deanna. <laughs> My glass is half empty because MSNBC, a supposed leader in the news industry, posted a very offensive racial remark on social media. But my glass is half full because Reince Priebus, chairman of the Republican Party, took the bull by the horns and threatened to hold officials and staff from appearing on MSNBC at all, forcing the network to formally, apo formally apologize. Linda Bruin. Well, my glass is half empty because it's been a frozen and slightly depressing winter. But my glass is half full because it's Super Bowl Sunday. I'm rooting for the Seahawks, and the fabulous Super Bowl ads are here. Mary Jo Boss. My glass is half full because Republican Dale Schultz is leaving the Wisconsin State Senate. My glass is half empty because Mike Ellis, <laughs> Luther Olson, and Rob Coles remain. We still have a veritable herd of rhinos in the GOP caucus. Well, my, my glass is half full because uh, Democratic State Representative Chris Sinicki was caught last week claiming thousands of dollars in per diem mileage expenses for driving back and forth to Madison. It's half empty because Sinicki is still in public office, even though she, apparently she's been driving without having a driver's license. Now, his union got him his job back after he used his computer to look at porn. He's a teacher. We'll talk about that when Sunday Insight continues. So what do you do with your computer at work? Middle school teacher was caught looking at pornography in his classroom computer. But he's back in that classroom. The district fired him back in 2010, but the teachers union went to bat for him and got an arbitrator to give him his job back. Last week, Governor Scott Walker stepped into the controversy, asking State Superintendent Tony Evers to strip the teacher, Andrew Harris, of his teacher's license. Cases such as this one, Walker said, are a good example why it was a good idea to reform collective bargaining rights. So who is right here? Linda oh, Bruin. Well, in this case, uh, not only did was Walker right in yeah. wanting this guy fired, but the Middleton School District asked the Department of okay. Public Instruction back in 2010 to invoke some of the clauses and help uh, revoke his license under their clauses while they were firing him because they knew he would he would go to court over it. And if DPI had acted in the last four years to remove him for for a mm. morals clause, then all of this legal matters wouldn't have happened. So DPI has screwed up even worse than, than the school district. Deanna Alexander. Would we expel a student from school if they brought pornography there? If we hold students to a standard like that, we have to hold those in authority over them, the teachers, to a higher standard and set an example. And any way you cut it, pornography does not belong in school. Governor's making the right decision here. Okay, Michael Holt. So my question is, what would DPI do now in response to the governor's request? Since it is coming from the governor, who they hate, Tony yeah. Evers hates, he probably won't do anything, which means this problem will just continue on. And in, until there's another case, maybe you'll have a Republican teacher and they'll, they'll get rid of him. 
Well, the other thing is how much money this cost. I mean, the school board took a strong stand, the administration took a strong stand, the parents made it very clear, the voters in this district said, you know, these are our community standards, this is our local control. We do not think that a teacher in the classroom looking at porn is consistent with that responsibility. And yet they are over, they're, they're overruled by this arbitrator. And again, it goes back to those days when the rights of the teacher, their entitlement to the job, trumped every other concern. And obviously the governor is is focusing on it because of that now there was uh, there were some news uh, you know articles afterwards saying that raising the question well was the governor being influenced by his deputy press secretary because one of his staffers was a parent in this district who had posted on facebook what do you make of that story that you might have had a staffer bringing this issue up and that's why the governor got involved the governor should use good information wherever he gets it it is outrageous that this guy is still around and that's the governor has been accused of circumventing the legal process yeah. but that's exactly why the legal revocation is in it, it's, it's on the books it's for for this DPI yeah. To, to step in at the request of the parents, the yeah. governor, and others to make what what parents think is happening okay, anyway. Okay, I, I, I got I to gotta say that, first of all, I thought that was one of the biggest so what news stories that I've seen in a long time. So, so you have a member of your staff who is affected by this, a mother who is concerned about this porn-watching teacher maybe being in the classroom with her daughter. She brings it up to the governor. Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? Right. You know, should, <laughs> yeah. I mean, aren't your staffers <laughs> supposed to be your eyes and your ears? And exactly. shouldn't you then respond to things that you are seeing out there? Uh, clearly, this gives the governor a, a chance a chance to uh, talk about Act 10 in a different way. But you may not want to hear it, but we're going to tell you anyway. Let's hand out some unsolicited advice. Michael Holt, you are first. Uh, to State Senator Luther Olson, whose education reform legislation was shot down 24 hours after it was introduced. Next time, try seeking input from parents, teachers, school administrators. Instead of a top-down solution, focus instead on a bottoms-up proposal. Mm, Deanna Alexander. My unsolicited advice is for the mayor of Toronto, <laughs> who has not only had drug problems himself, but is now vocally defending fellow Canadian Justin Bieber for using drugs in drag racing in the United States. This is not the type of news story you should be championing to redeem yourself. Who knew Canada? L Linda Bruin. The number of young children poisoned by electronic cigarettes has tripled in just two years. The liquid nicotine in them can even kill a toddler. Parents, keep your children away from e-cigarettes. Mary Jo Boss. My unsolicited advice is for the Republican leaders in the state Senate. Get on board with the tax cuts or you can kiss your majority goodbye. Well, my unsolicited advice, Mr. President. The next time you come to Wisconsin, you might want your advance team to spell out Waukesha and Abley phonetically. It helps, really. Next on Sunday, inside to close or not to close in the extreme cold, who made the right decisions, who blew it? Look, I don't need to tell you how cold it was around here last week. Weather was one of the week's biggest stories. Roads in Georgia were snarled for days. When did they actually go to the bathroom when they were playing? And here, the temperatures dropped into the double digits below zero. Schools across the state were closed. And in Milwaukee County, Executive Chris Abley, that's pronounced Abley, uh, shut down Milwaukee County government offices, but city offices stayed open, along with county offices in Ozaki, Waukesha, Racine, and Washington counties. So let's do some second guessing here. Michael Holt, who got the week in weather right and who got it wrong? Well, I think EPS got it right because I've seen kids, believe it or yeah. not, in the middle of this frigid weather with just like uh, light jackets on and yeah. stuff. Uh, I think Abley got it wrong. There are certain essential county city services that should remain open. Uh, and for him to close it, it was arbitrarily keep people out in the okay, cold. Okay, you're, you're a county supervisor. The county executive shuts down county government. Are you guys frail, kind of fragile? Is, that, is there a difference between county government? County government is more non-essential than city government. When you're the decision maker on a situation like that where people's safety could or could not be at risk, you make your decision with the information you have. Now, to his credit, even though he made the wrong decision in the beginning, he has since admitted that he should have left the courthouse open. So, you know, there's something to be said for a public official that will admit when they make a mistake. Okay, your take. I think my take on this is that I'd rather that Chris Abley made the wrong decision in trying to be and being overprotective than doing what the governor did in Georgia, where he made the wrong decision by not taking appropriate action this enough. Okay, well, that, now that's interesting. In terms of who got the week wrong the worst, it is Atlanta, it is Georgia. 
a state, and by the way, they, they understand exactly what this does for their national image, and, and, and I think this is a, more than a PR disaster for them, because it does raise questions. If you can't get this right, what else are you getting wrong? You know, and as, a, as, a, as an area that has been very, very aggressive in recruiting companies, you know, CEOs to come down there, not exactly the image you want of an entire region in absolute total But in answer to your other question, yeah. those $10 Starbucks cups work pretty well. At least for the men. Okay, well, no, I mean, seriously, th these roads were blocked up for hours and hours and hours, and I was waiting for, you know, the CNN reporter to go, okay, um, when, when nature called, what did you people do? They were in no. their cars for, uh, some, yeah. some people were in their cars for up for 20, 21 to 24 hours. Wow. A baby was born on the side of the road because the husband and wife couldn't get off the freeway. This was really serious, and I'm surprised that somebody didn't die. Oh, okay, who, so who got it right and wrong? I would, say, I would say Tom Barrett got, it, yeah, got yeah. it right. He kept it open. He said, you know, if you got a problem, you know, you can take the day off or do what you need yeah. to do, but keep it open. I think Mark, Congressman Mark Pocan got it. The timing was abysmal for him to be writing about global warming. He must have had a staffer yeah. putting that out who had never been north of the Mason-Dixon <laughs> line. I, I guess I would, yeah, well, that, that's obviously true. I mean, it, you, the timing was a little bit awkward there for Mark Pocan to talk about the, you know, particularly the fact that he you know, spoke on the House of, uh, of Representatives floor talking about the lack of ice. The same week we find out that there is more ice on the Great Lakes than there's been in decades. I guess the question is, does Chris Abley actually talk to anybody? Does he, you know, coordinate with the county and every other government? And, and here's the other point. If you're going to be shutting down an entire unit of government, shouldn't you, like, think through that, during an emergency, shouldn't government be there to help people? But then again, you know, Chris, Chris Abley didn't make that much of an impression with the president, did he? So. Okay, so is what they said this week the same as what you heard? Let's go around the table. Michael Holt. Did you watch the reactions of the military brass on the State of the Union? They gave standing ovations to everything said about the military until the president mentioned bringing the troops home from Afghanistan at year's end. Then they sat like mute dummies with scowls on their faces. I can only guess what message they were sending. Deanna Alexander. Speaking about small businesses that have invoiced Milwaukee County for courthouse repairs and how some county supervisors object to the county paying the bills, Supervisor David Cullen remarked, oh well, if they go out of business, they go out of business. Mm -hmm. What I heard was confirmation that to them, the hardworking middle class just doesn't matter. Linda Bruin. Last yeah. week when Mike Huckabee said low income women can't control their libido or their re reproductive systems without the help of government, I know he meant every insulting, paternalistic, and sexist word that he said because he's said them before. Mary Jo Boss. In his State of the Union address, President Obama said, some, th some items require congressional action, and I'm eager to work with all of you, but America does not stand still and neither will I. What I heard was, Congress, I don't need no stinking Congress. Well, Mary Burke said she was too busy to appear with President Obama last week. What I heard with your poll numbers, I don't want to be caught in the same zip code with you. Now, next on Sunday Inside, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. First, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick the winners and losers of the week. Michael Holt, you're first. Well, my loser, Democratic gubernatorial candidate Mary Burke, who was too busy to be seen with the president during his visit here Thursday. For reasons already stated, she missed a golden opportunity that will come back to haunt her. Mm. My winner, equal pay for women, raising the minimum wage, using his executive order to pry Congress back. President Obama didn't offer much new in the State of the Union, but it was more than enough to make him my winner of the week. Deanna Alexander. My winner this week is Governor Scott Walker, who set aside partisan politics to do the right thing and personally and positively greet President Obama, welcoming him to our great state. My losers this week are the taxpayers of Milwaukee County. The county board is moving forward with a bill that not only sets an artificial minimum wage, but unfairly grants it to only certain workers. Hmm. Linda Bruin. Well, my winner is the Middleton School District, who spent up to $1 million trying to keep a porn reading teacher or porn viewing teacher out of the classroom and away from children. My loser is Georgia Governor Nathan Deal for his state's disastrous response to Winter Storm Leon. Thousands of children spent the night in their schools, or worse, in stranded buses. Thousands of drivers had to abandon their car, and many others spent up to 24 hours in their car with no food, no bathrooms, and the bitter cold. Mary Jo Boss. My winner is Sergeant First Class Corey Remsburg, a U.S. Army Ranger who served 10 tours of duty before being hit by a roadside bomb in Afghanistan and was appropriately recognized during President Obama's State of the Union address. 
My losers are Tom Barrett, Gwen Moore, and anyone else who continues to run down the city of Milwaukee as part of their temper tantrum against the ruling overturning the city's 75-year-old residency requirement. Well, my loser, Waukesha Mayor Jeff Screma, who managed to alienate both Democrats and Republicans this week by dissing both President Obama and Governor Walker. Screma said he wouldn't appear with either one because he said they were extremists. Get used to saying ex-Mayor Screma. My winner, Bob Euchre, the legendary voice of the Milwaukee Brewers, who says he's going to be cutting back on his road trips this season, but he's not going anywhere, and Euchre is still the voice of spring around here, and that can't come soon enough. Thanks for joining us and joining for my radio show Monday morning on News Radio 620 WTMJ. Enjoy the Super Bowl.